welcome to the community. It's, it's great to uh, be here today and, and, and get a chance to hear what's on your mind through the questions that you're posing and share a little bit about what, what I'm doing here and, and uh, start to start start to interact and, and connect. So I appreciate the time today and I look forward to much more in the future. Um, so let me start briefly. Uh, it's August 19th. I've been here all of, uh, been with Marquette now all of two and a half months. Uh, so I'm sure you'll be able to stump me, but it should be fun regardless. Uh, I came from Salesforce before Marketa, where I worked for about seven years. Uh, and prior to that, I was with Microsoft, uh, actually just shy of my 20th anniversary at Microsoft. So I was there for a very long time. I've been in the, the kind of distributed systems, large scale computation systems for a long time. Um, although frankly, over the tenure of my career, I've worked on everything from compilers and databases to websites and, and kind of everything in between. So. I find fun, interesting, challenging, impactful, and worthwhile technical challenges to work on just about anywhere. And Marketa has those in spades. Uh, and it's in furtherance for global money movement, a, a vision and a need that people have around the world that I find very interesting. So I'm very happy to be here with you today and thanks again. So it's a fantastic question. We, I, I've heard this uh, actually just a couple of weeks ago, talking to the team that works on some of this today. I can't tell you exactly when that's gonna happen, but I will share that the idea of improving, continually improving the experience for our developers and, and for our partners in the ecosystem to ensure you have the right documentation, you have the right APIs, you have the right ability to simulate them, to test them, to do perf and scale, things of this nature. These are areas that are clearly very important to the utility, the flexibility, and the trust of our platform. And so it's absolutely an area that we will continue to invest in over time. So first off, thank you for being brave enough to, uh, to share that with all of us. Uh, and congratulations on, on, on your first job out of school. Uh, I hope you're having fun, even if it is kind of challenging and, and scary at times as well. Um, you know, I remember my, my first you know, few days, few weeks, few, few, few months and, and, and few years. Uh, and frankly, even now, I still always feel like I don't know what's going on and I have no idea what, what I should know and, and I'm pretty sure that I don't know everything I should know. But the, the, the thing that kind of always has helped me through this is intellectual curiosity. If I'm learning a little bit more every day, if I'm peeling an onion a little bit more, if I'm getting a, a, a slightly better understanding of what I'm working on, of the systems I'm interacting with, of, of the, the people I'm working with, um, then I feel pretty good about it, right? And you know, it's, it's impossible to know everything. In fact, you know, we're, we're a, a highly intellectual field, but it, it, none of us will ever know every little last thing that we wish we did or, or maybe even feel that we should. Um, but I think if we can approach things with curiosity, if we can look each and every day to, to learn and to grow and to enhance our understanding of our field, of the systems we're working on, of kind of everything that, that, that helps us feel that sense of mastery, I think it helps a bit. And no matter how long you've been doing this, if this is your first job, if you've been in industry for 10, 15, you know, even 35 years, I think it's very natural and, and very common and frankly expected to have that sense of not belonging, of, of not being competent, of, of not being sure that, that you know everything that one should and kind of even have the skills that you should. Um, but keep at it, hang in there. Uh, with, with, with practice, I, I think it will be easier for you in that you'll realize that none of us know everything and it's just a matter of prioritizing and learning and, and pushing through. Um, so I wish you the best and, and thanks for raising something that, that is uh, a challenging topic, um, you know, it takes a lot of bravery and, and self-awareness to, to share that and, and, and even realize it in ourselves. So I appreciate that. I think a big thing and, and kind of a starting point for me is, is trust, right? It, it, it's ensuring the system always works. You know, you, you, you need your card to work. You need every direct deposit to work. You know, as an individual, as a corporation, we make many, many financial transactions every day, every month, every year. And kind of the, the certainty that the system is doing what we expect it to is just as critical uh, as it would be for these very large scale uh, kind of infrastructure systems. And so there's a lot of similar engineering challenges. There's a lot of similar quality challenges. There's a lot of similar concerns, if you will. 
even if some of the exact kind of trade-offs, the exact technology, the exact integration points, et cetera, might be a little bit different. But at the end of the day, it's a lot of the same concepts. It's distributed systems, it's how you interact and integrate with other systems in a highly performance and reliable way. Uh, it, it's ensuring that you have the right kind of connectivity and, and integration points globally. Uh, it, it, there's a lot of parallels here. And I think especially as you think about a growth company and a growth platform like Marketa, there's a huge amount of similarity. And a lot of the work that you do in terms of a high scale environment is always in sort of improving that next point of scale to ensure that you're ready for your customers and your partners' needs. You know, the work I did uh, for Bing Search, for instance, back in Microsoft, a lot of that was focused not only on building the next set of features for the product, but also in, in ensuring that the platforms and all the capabilities within the system were ready as the web continued to grow and as the user base of the internet continued to grow. The same is very true here in Marketo. So there's a lot of similarity, maybe not in terms of the exact technical challenge in each place, but there's an awful lot of similarity in how you attack the problems, how you approach things, and some of the needs there. So it's very fun actually to see, uh, and, and in fact, one of the things I love to do is, is talk with folks in, in very different industries or very different verticals in the kind of technology domain, because you'll, you'll see these commonalities and these shared themes and these shared needs over and over again. And I find that to be a, a, a really enjoyable opportunity and chance to share things with others in the industry, even if they're working in a completely different field. So it's a great question. I kind of have to come back and say, I've been here two and a half months. I'm not sure what they are yet. You know, I've started to hear from some of our customers about things that they need and some of our other partners. Uh, you know, I think whenever you're in a growth situation, a lot of the same challenges apply, whether it's international expansion, whether it's bringing on new partners, whether it's features, whether it's performance, whether it's raw transaction volume and capabilities. Uh, I'm not quite sure yet what those are gonna be, and, and I'm also not sure what, what the most challenging or, or difficult areas are gonna be. Uh, it's certainly something, you know, it's part of what makes this voyage fun for me and this journey very fun for me, because uh, it gives me a chance to dig in in a new place obviously work with a lot of the skills and, and, and strengths that I bring to the table, but learn in an entirely new uh, domain, an entirely new set of technology and, and uh, capabilities, if you will. So I'm having a blast figuring that out, but I'm sorry I don't have a good example of, of, of what that might be for us. Stay tuned though, because you know, you know, you're gonna be along for this journey with us. So once again, I deserve the right to come back and, and know more tomorrow than I do today, and, and certainly know more in a, in a couple of months than I do today. Um, but I do wanna share a couple of observations that I have so far. So first off, Marketa is a very innovative company and it's a very innovative platform. And what I've seen our customers able to do with the kind of API-led approach, and the API, uh, the ease of the API that, that we have on top of payments, it's really impressive. And it unlocks such a tremendous amount of innovation and a tremendous amount of creativity in our customers and our partners and, and really in the ecosystem around Marketa. I think that's fantastic. And I'm really, really, really excited to see how that extends and, and see how we can provide even more capability, if you will, to the ecosystem through that platform and see what, what more and, and what, what, what new, unique and, and innovative and, and really, frankly, fantastic ideas come out. Um, you know, the, the, the fact that the, the system is hardened and, and scaled to very large customers and yet is approachable enough to be used for, for almost more experimental or, or, or very new ideas, I think that's another strong point of the Marketo platform and the Marketo offering. And I think finding ways to preserve that to make it very innovative, very agile, very easy to consume, and yet also something that can scale up to a very large system as your kind of... Uh, projects with us grow, as, as your customers grow, et cetera. I think that's kind of a key piece and, and something that I'm very excited about. You know, I love being part of an ecosystem where when each one of us does a better job, everyone is able to do a better job as well. And my ability to provide capabilities for you so that you can go and do fantastic things for your customers, it, it's just a very, very exciting place to be in. And you know, it's something I've, I've worked in various ways around for a long time. I've been in a lot of different platform businesses, um, you know, all the way back in, what was it, uh, 92, 93 maybe, 
Um, you know, I worked in the Visual C++ team at Microsoft, uh, and I worked in, in the compilers and, and libraries group in particular. Some of the work we did there to enable the developer community around Microsoft Windows, around C++ in the early days, that was so much fun. And it's a similar thing here at Marketa, the ability to power and kind of speed each and every one of you in your time to market and provide that capability and global money movement. For me, that's very exciting and, and very, very, very powerful. Regarding our competitors, I, I you know, I've been, it's early days. Uh, the one thing I'd say is, is I've seen just way more agility and, and kind of the, the ability to really quickly do something that really works. Um, I, I think that's a strong suit of ours. If we think about the um, kind of cloud providers as providing capability and, and, and uh, uh, how, how should I think about this, capacity really, the truth is we, we've had a, a very few number of providers for a long time. You know, the, most of the CPUs in our industry for, for a, a very long period of time have come from Intel, have come from AMD. Now, obviously there, there, there's a, a larger segment in ARM. I see ARM has been huge in mobile, but when we think about server software, primarily it's been Intel and AMD for a very long time. You know, early in the 90s, uh, we, we had a few other strong contenders, but it's been a long time where we we're really focused around the x86 architecture. I think cloud can be a very similar thing. I, I think we'll see that, that there is sort of a, a standardization of what core cloud capabilities are. And the fact that that, that may be a, a relatively small number of companies, as long as they're running at scale, I, I think as an industry, that's a very healthy place to be. You know, trying to support, it's a, it's a hard business. You know, my work in Azure and, and other large infrastructure platforms, it's really hard to do this well. And so trying to have too many companies do it at a small scale, I think is really hard to provide services that, that we can all consume and use with a high degree of trust and, and, and sort of resilience baked in. It's just hard engineering to do that at a really high degree of, of capability and quality. So when I think about this, um, obviously they, we, they, there needs to be competition in the marketplace, there needs to be health in the marketplace, there needs to be offerings in particular regions. So strong kind of broad support is very key. I for one am not super concerned about consolidation in the market. As long as we have a few players, I'm happy. You know, there, there's a, a push in, in some places to run on multiple cloud providers. In my experience, that's a really, really hard thing to do. And once again, if you're, unless you're running it at a really huge scale, you know, it kind of getting the real benefit from your partner in the space, being able to really understand the, the kind of complexities and, and real behavior of that platform, I think is very helpful in, in allowing one to focus on what's really important to your business and really important to your customers, as opposed to necessarily trying to run your software on two or three or, or, or even say 10 different providers. So I think it's kind of a natural transition for us and, and something that what we all need to be mindful of, I'm not super concerned about in, in terms of where the industry goes. There's enough competition, it's kind of a commodity business with some really useful, good differentiation on top in terms of what you're trying to build. Let me break this down in, in, a, in a couple of ways, because I, I think about this in, in, in one set, this is kind of build versus buy, and it's a great kind of carryover from the last question about uh, cloud, cloud providers and cloud vendors. So I think there's build versus buy. There's also the aspect of kind of when you have an internal system, a, a, a component that's really part of your product and, and is really even very differentiated, how do you make the decisions to evolve it kind of in situ, to kind of focus on monotonic improvement and, and kind of an incremental approach versus when and if you need to make a, a more sort of large scale cutover, if you will, to a, a, a different approach to replace that, that piece internally to your system. So I, I'm, I'm gonna think about, or I do think about this in kind of these two separate buckets, and so I'm gonna address them in that way as well. So on the build versus buy stance, I'm a huge fan of taking advantage of off-the-shelf things that just work, whether it's open source, whether it's a SaaS offering. You know, when, when, when there's something out there that fits well into your solution, that's solving a problem that's not unique and differentiated, it's not a core part of your business, 
but it's something you really need in order to provide the platform, the capabilities, the features, the product that you're working on. Fantastic. If you can have someone else worry about that, if they can meet your compliance needs, if, if they can, or not, not only just meet, but alleviate you from some of them, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's tremendous. And the ability to kind of integrate something, never free, but the ability to integrate something and then get the ongoing benefit of their innovation and their iteration, that's fantastic. Once again, when I think about that for our systems, they're not free. It, it, it's not that you just, you know, kind of figure out what the SaaS subscription or, or, or what the, the OPEX is going to be and then don't have any heads and don't have any people assigned to it. You clearly need people to keep those things rich and vibrant and, and really meeting their business needs for you. But I think it's great to not need to spend a bunch of time writing code for things that are kind of table stakes. The trick, of course, though, is when you look at your overall system, you don't want too many different things going on. If everything is kind of a patchwork of stitching things together, then it can be very hard to make kind of evolutionary progress for your own product, even in the areas that you really do need to be differentiated. So I think it's kind of a, a continual question that I like to ask myself and I like to ask the rest of our team and our organization, first off to see, is this something we really need to build ourselves? Is it something that we'd be better served by kind of bringing in another vendor, bringing in an existing component and, and their evolution and their product roadmap over time? And then the kind of counterbalance to that is, does it fit well? Is it kind of isolated? Or is it going to have tendrils into everything in kind of a broad, complicated way, as opposed to kind of a simple, straightforward integration that still preserves a high degree of agility and, and innovation in the areas of your business that you really need to focus on. So that's on the build versus buy side. On the side of something that we are definitely building, you know, a piece of core technology, a, a piece of differentiation, a piece of ongoing innovation that we want to bring to our platform, to our product, to our customers, to the industry. This is a, a really interesting question as well. You know, how do you think about replacing that thing yourself versus evolving it over time. For me, this shifted a lot when software shifted to be more and more based on services, whether it's running on my own hardware, whether it's running in a public cloud, or even if it's running on my customer's hardware, but I am pushing updates in a much more service-oriented fashion, things like Google Chrome do today, for instance. Uh, I feel that this has shifted the dynamic a lot, right? And it's gotten us to the point where the calculus between the frequency and sort of magnitude of, of, a, of a change should alter. You know, when, when we used to ship floppy disks, when we shipped CD-ROMs, even if someone has to kind of download a big update and apply it, your, your, your desire to, to do that frequently goes down, obviously. And so the granularity or the magnitude of each new release should go up. So in that world, I think we tended to, as, as engineers, do a lot more sort of whole place uh, or, or, or uh, whole scale replacing the existing components, kind of writing the V3 version of something. In my life as services, which, you know, it's, it's 2021, you know, I've been in this space now for, for over 20 years. When you're dealing with running the code yourself or, or you have a, a nicely controlled way to get updates and deployments to your customers, I think that shifts dramatic, uh, drastically. And the reason is the frequency of those updates has come down tremendously. So then when I think about the actual value that you're giving your customers, the actual value you're producing for the ecosystem, for the industry, that time to market piece is a huge part, right? Because with each little improvement, even if it's very, very, very small, we're getting more value out there into our users. We're getting more value out there into the world. And it has that cumulative effect of every day it's running for someone, we get that benefit. So it has shifted my preference or thinking, if you will, quite significantly towards incrementalism for those components that, that we build ourselves and, and those components that, that are kind of differentiated and, and highly innovative. Now, you can't always do this, obviously, but I have a very, very strong bias for finding ways to make incremental improvement, even to get to that new future point that looks very, very, very different than when you started. And I will often have debate internally, re really rich, useful debate about the, the proper course, right? And we'll have an idea of where we wanna be in the future. And maybe it's architecturally very different from where we are today for some particular component. 
And then we'll debate, you know, what, what's the right way to do this? Should we do it incrementally and kind of take step-by-step -step steps there, shipping each one, getting value to our customers, getting feedback, or should we kind of do a, a replacement, if you will, build that V2 of that component and sort of try to jump right to that target? Nearly always, we find that even if it takes longer to get to that new view of where we want to be, that kind of V2 architecture, we'd rather go incrementally because of that incremental value and because of the fact that it allows us to learn every day and therefore significantly reduce the fact that we build the wrong thing. It drastically enhances, increases the confidence and the trust, if you will, in the work that we do every day. And it gives everyone an opportunity to learn with each little step along the way. So I'm a huge, huge, huge fan of incrementalism. Great question. You also probably notice it's a topic I find very interesting and, and uh, fun and, and frankly, it's something we could probably spend the entire hour talking about. First off, I don't know how wise my words are, but, but I'll certainly share my, my perspective and, and, and my experience along the way. Um, I believe tremendously in giving yourself the time to go deep and really understand things. I think the strongest leaders I've ever worked for, the people I've really learned from and really respected and, and really had fun working with the industry are people who didn't try to race their way through various career stages. They, they weren't trying to get to a, a particular level of seniority or, or, or a particular level of scope or something. They were really driven by a desire to have a deep mastery in the space. And their careers kind of evolved very organically and, and naturally as a result. Sometimes it, it may have taken them a little longer to get to a particular step along the way. But the thing I saw over and over is those were the people who got farther in, in their career. Maybe it took an extra five years, maybe it even took an extra 10 years to get to something that, that, that uh, you know, was a, a, a maybe a, a huge milestone or something, but they were the people who really did a fantastic job of it and still had headroom to keep going. You know, I remember very early on uh, getting some, some wise counsel from someone, uh, uh, my, my, my uh, mentor really uh, back at Microsoft um, in the early 90s, and he basically encouraged me to do the same thing. You know, I, I was feeling a little lost at one point. We, we had shipped a version of something and I wasn't quite sure what to do. Um, and I was worried about breadth and, and kind of building new skills and all of this. Uh, and he encouraged me to enjoy getting really, really deep and, and really, really getting good at what I was doing versus worrying about the next thing. And that was actually very comforting for me because it, it kind of let me think that, yeah, like that I can get good at this and I can give myself the time to get really good at this. You know, this being sort of understanding how to write, you know, at that point it was desktop software, right? To get really good as a C++ engineer, really good at writing stable, safe, performant code, you know, getting good at, at designing the software and, 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 and figuring out how to balance some of these trade-offs we've been talking about. Um, you know, my encouragement to you would, would be to wait as long as you can, you know, put off people management, put off worrying about trying to, to add parallel industries or, or, or parallel skills, really just give yourself the luxury of becoming truly deep, masterful, and feeling really, really good at the core of your job. You'll always be busy. More and more things will come to you. It, it, it's not like there's ever the, the one opportunity in our lives. So I don't think you need to chase those things. I think they will come very naturally based on a really rich, deep understanding, a little patience, coupled with that curiosity, right? If, if you're constantly driving to go deeper, to understand something at a greater level, it'll set you up really, really well. So I, I wish you all the best. Uh, I, I hope I can hear from you again in a few years to, to see how things are going for you. Um, but I would really encourage you not to feel rushed and instead focus on, on mastery and, and you know, the, the depth that comes with that. Great question. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of M&A over the years. Uh, and, and so bringing on early stage software, bringing on early stage teams, I've certainly seen a, a, a bunch of things over the years. Um, 
I have tried to use a lot of automation here. So, so whenever possible, you know, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of automated approaches, obviously hand in hand with, with education and training, but you kind of bring that along a little later. But when you're thinking about, especially in an M&A environment, you've got a whole new code base, you have a whole new product, kind of how are you going to get that up to your level of standards or at least understand the delta and the risk pretty quickly? I think automated code analysis is a tremendously powerful tool. Using that to compare it to what you have, to really getting a good understanding of how what the risk profile of that code base looks like so that you can make intelligent decisions about the trade-offs and the, the, the really the, the, the risks that, that you may be accepting um, to get it fairly quickly into the state of known as, a, as opposed to the state of unknown. I think it's a huge, I'm, I'm a huge fan of it. Uh, and, and you know, there, there's obviously lots of good dedicated tools around security for static code analysis, but frankly, I'm a mammoth fan of, of any and every bit of static code, and static code analysis you can possibly do, um, in addition to runtime analysis, but, but I'm a big fan of static analysis. This is everything from turning on every warning you possibly can in your compiler, uh, turning on everything, you know, bringing in a linter and, and doing everything you can there to obviously richer tools on top of that that, that are very focused specifically on security. So I think that's a, a, a big piece. Um, I'd also suggest doing threat modeling, you know, at least to, to get a, an idea of where are your exposure points in the system. It'll take a little bit of time, but it once again allows you to think about and structure your approach in a way that you have a much better sense of, of where those risks might be and what to do about them. So these are a couple of tools I, I use a lot. Um, you also need some expertise, right? And sometimes, especially in a small startup, an early stage startup, it can be hard to get that. So I suggest working your network, talking to others, and maybe trying to recruit someone with a cybersecurity background, even fairly early on, because it's certainly a lot easier to build in some of the things that you need to have a secure system, a secure and scalable system earlier on, rather than trying to bolt it on later. Uh, you know, don't stunt your growth by, by doing things far before they're appropriate, but it, it is, the, the, the more you start to think about those early on, the, the easier and the better. Um, you know, I, I had a journey of this at, at, at Microsoft with the Trustworthy Computing Initiative, and that obviously what was kind of a late wake-up call for Microsoft and a late wake-up call for the industry at large. But even within the company, we used a lot of the same concepts and tools. We used threat modeling, we used static code analysis, and that allowed us to pretty quickly change both how engineers thought about it, do a lot of kind of uh, very natural on the job training and education, but also give us some really good signal back in terms of just the state of things and, and kind of how much, what, what the gap really was to what we were trying to do. So it's a powerful tool to, to kind of really, well, like I said before, re really kind of clarify and shine a light on some of the unknowns. So I wish you well, it's, it's an exciting and frankly challenging journey. I, I would even amend this a little bit. It's not just even in a new company, obviously it's magnified when you come into a new company, but anytime you start working with a new group of people, anytime you start working with a new product, a new division, kind of in anything that you maybe weren't involved with before, I think a lot of the same habits, at least I apply a lot of the same habits regardless. Obviously, the, the scope is a little bit different in, in sort of how much complexity there is, how many things to learn in, in, in new dimensions there are. The same basic ideas, I, I, I think, uh, apply very well. So my starting point, and I love that you use the word context here, because for me, that's key. We, we all have experience. We all have our expertise and our skills, but the context is going to be different. And really learning that and understanding it, you know, getting to the point where, where one's intuition is kind of calibrated, um, where, where, where your understanding of the system, of the people, of the expectations, of the needs, et cetera, that takes time. And it takes a lot of listening. So I always start these things with, with, with the goal of, pardon me, with, with the goal of talking to everyone I possibly can, of asking a lot of questions, of looking silly and uninformed and, and, and stupid, uh, but just really giving myself the opportunity to learn and to hear from everybody involved, to learn as much as I can, as quickly as I can. You know, when I can, I, I, I read a lot of material, whether it's internal material, whether it's industry books, uh, uh, you know, blogs, any, any other things that, that might help me get up to speed. And also just talking to live one-on-one, -on -one, or in the case of, of, of life during the pandemic, a lot more video calls than, than, than maybe in past years. 
but really just hearing from folks and then starting to synthesize and internalize that picture. You know, even in an ongoing situation, if you're a leader in an organization, a big part of our job is to bring that context. And that context needs to evolve over time as well. So when we have one-on-ones, when we have team meetings, et cetera, part of what I'm looking to do is to improve my overall context and understanding, and then also to share the context and understanding I have from parts of the company outside of the team or the individual I'm meeting with, with this person, so that they can make better decisions over time using the context of the rest of the company, the rest of the organization. So uh, that kind of constant flow of information up and down and side to side and, and really all around the company and, and all around an industry as much as possible. I think that does a fantastic uh, good thing for an organization to ensure everyone is kind of aligned about what's important and why it's important and has the backdrop of that context, if you will, so that the folks, we, we, the, you know, the subject matter experts, the people who are deepest in a particular area have the benefit of that sort of abstracted synthesized context upon which to make their decisions and, and, and work in their day-to-day -day life. You know, to jump into the second part of understanding what is working and what is not working, yeah, that's about listening, right? It, it, people know, right? You, you, you talk to folks, you talk to customers, you talk to engineers, you talk to product owners, you talk to our partners around the company, you talk to other folks that, that, that you, you may work with. Um, it, it, it's not rocket science, right? People know what's hard, people know where there's friction, People know what's what's the kind of the superpower within an organization and drawing that out in conversation, giving people the permission to talk about it and then following through, right? You know, it's saying, oh, you know what? This is a serious thing. This is something we should go work on or, or this really is our superpower. How do we enhance it? How, how do we embrace it? How, how do we get even more benefit and value out of it? You know, it's, it's kind of that follow through. You have to do more than just listen just kind of build that context, you have to build the muscle to follow it through and do things. And one of those muscles is gonna say, yep, this is a real issue, this is a real thing, but it's gonna be low on the priority list, so we're not gonna do anything about it now, but we're gonna be explicit about it so that people don't kind of just have pent up frustration or, or feel that their opinion and, and, and perspective and views don't matter. Because the reality is the people working on a product day in and day out, they're always going to have the details. They're always going to know what's going on. They're going to do a much better job of understanding what we should be focused on than I ever will. My job is to listen, to reflect, to aggregate, and to help align us, and then to help make some trade-offs about what are the, the kind of big things we need to do and what are the, the big steps and big trade-offs we might make. So in sum, it's all about talking. And most importantly, it's all about listening and then kind of following through on 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 what's said. So hope that helps. Um, that's certainly the journey I'm on here at Marquetta. Uh, and it's the journey that I've used whenever I've started working with a new organization or a new product in the past, even if I'm not changing, changing organizations or, or, or changing companies. I am super excited to work more and more with the Marquetta community. You know, th thinking back very early to my career at Microsoft, you know, I mentioned before I was working in the Visual C++ team, be part of what we called the developer division back in the early 90s. And one of the things I really, really loved was getting connected to the developer community worldwide. People who were building their businesses, building their careers, building their products on top of that platform. And I am really excited that we have created this here. I'm really excited to work with this group to kind of jointly evolve this and, and provide that opportunity for each and every one of us. You know, then I had a similar experience with the Trailblazer community at Salesforce, the ability to connect with the admins and the developers and the people who were really kind of driving their business, driving their work, driving their careers, using and leveraging the Salesforce platform. I think it's fantastic. And it provides fantastic input, you know, as, as I mentioned before about kind of how do you learn and build that context. That's how, right? Hearing from each and every one, one of you about what you're doing, about the new innovative ideas you have, about thoughts you have about how we can make it easier. You know, even if you don't know what we should be doing to help you, I'd love to hear from each and every one of you because it will help us think of the right thing. It'll help us bring the right or kind of focus our innovation and our thinking in ways that you can capitalize on and, and, and you can sort of be a multiplier on top of. So I couldn't be more excited to have this vehicle 
And I'm very glad that we're all meeting here today. And I look forward to being an active part of this community for a long time to come. This is a, a great question. So for me, product and technology, even if it's, it's two teams, two leaders, it's actually one team. We have one job to do. We need to provide the community and our customers and the industry with fantastic products. We each bring different skills. We each bring a different perspective. But at the end of the day, Kevin and I need to act and, and, and think as much as possible as one person. So our goal is to be, you know, to, to, to spend a lot of time together, to, to work together very closely, to align our thinking about where we want to take the organization, where we want to take the product, uh, and then to use that as a way to help empower our teams to specialize, but to be very, very clearly aligned on what the goals are, what the outcome is, or, or what the intended outcomes are, and how we get there, right? The, the steps along the way and how to recognize how we're doing, right? What, what are the, the metrics and measures and data we're gonna look at to tell us if we're doing the right things or not? So I'm a huge fan of having very different mindsets, backgrounds, experiences, all working together to solve a, a common need or a common problem. And I think product and tech is a very natural place to show that uh, where, where we have you know, Kevin and myself and all the way through our entire uh, you know, wonderful organization, kind of pairing up the appropriate leaders to think about particular parts of the business, particular products, particular technology challenges, and kind of the, the, the work that we're going to do to bring value to you and, and the rest of our, our customers and, and the community around Marketa. Um, I think it's something like you know, the, the relationship we were talking about earlier, it just takes time, right? You, you need to spend time together. You need to talk about a lot of things. You need to be open, you need to be vulnerable, you need to be willing to ask stupid questions, you, you need to be willing to, to feel like an imposter at times, because that's how you get that common understanding, that's how you get that, that common context. And it doesn't mean Kevin and I always agree with everything, but that we've committed to each other to work through every last little bit of it, pick our path, and then be fully committed to it together. Wow. That's a good one. Um, <laughs> you know, honestly, I, 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 I have a lot of things that I feel really good about. And, you know, some of them, I, I have a lot of joy looking back on, on some of the technical things I've done, but the things that, that, that really make me feel like, like I, I had the biggest impact and, and it really mattered, they were when the people around me saw their own successes as well. And I think if I have to pick one, uh, there's a person I, I, I worked with, um, what, from probably 2004-ish to 2014-ish. And, and the, the, the dates might not be exactly right, but, but, but for about that 10-year that, that period, um, it was a really amazing person incredibly bright, incredibly kind, a, a great leader, very good to the people around them, uh, and, and a fantastic technologist, ju ju just, just an amazing person. Loved working with this person. Uh, they, they followed me, uh, I think, two times. So, so, so I think they, they, they worked for me in three different teams over that decade. Um, but, but that proudest moment, what was, about 10 years later, when I got a text message from his wife. And in that text message, they, they were, uh, she, she was sharing, you know, would you please write a little note to celebrate this person's uh, promotion to technical fellow? Now, technical fellow at, at, at Microsoft is, is the absolute kind of top recognition of, of a real exemplary techno, technical leader. Uh, it, uh, uh, you know, many of these people are, are luminaries in their industries, not only within the company, but, but really across the board. And to hear from her, to hear the success this person had, had in their career, to hear about the recognition that they, they, they saw and, and frankly very much deserved. Um, and for this person and, and their spouse to think that I had had a, a, a meaningful impact on, on their life to the point that you know, 10 years later, they were reaching out to me 
to celebrate that success and, and kind of ask me to weigh in. That was really just a, a, an amazing experience um, and, and something that, that to this day, just I am incredibly proud of. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I think we're about at time. This, this was a, a fantastic experience and I really look forward to getting to know all of you more and more over time.